All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, let me uh, go ahead and get the sign-in sheet passed around. Um, before we get into things, so you all had a, a homework assignment due today, and of course, being a professor in grad school, I've got another one for you. Um, this one, I don't think is going to be as bad as the one you just did. It, it's not, there's not really much complicated to it. Um, I just want us to have a little bit of experience with beam analysis before the exam. So, okay. I'll, I'll get this. Okay. So what I'm going to do is this um, in terms of uh, scheduling and what have you so that everybody's got an idea of the, uh, the schedule to date. Um, so today I'm giving you a homework assignment. That homework assignment is due on Thursday. And um, instead of giving you an in-class exam, I'm going to give you a take-home. It won't be in any way, shape, or form as intense as some of the homeworks you've had. It's um, mostly going to be uh, just uh, testing your understanding of the concepts. I may give you a, a big structure, but I'm not going to ask you to analyze it for, to, from start to finish. I may ask you key components of that, of that problem and make sure that you can understand how to do those key components, but we're not going to do a start to finish full-blown analysis. Again, that's what the homework's for. The exam is to make sure you have an understanding of what those mean. Okay? So it's not going to be anything massive. All right? But I'll give you a week to do that, and then you'll turn it in. Everybody good? Okay. So um, I, I made this point last time, and it was probably a little subtle. Let me go ahead and close this. It was probably a little subtle, and, and uh, it, it, it will be, uh, I would argue, for the next couple of days that up until now what we really haven't been doing, we really haven't been doing finite element analysis. We've been doing matrix stiffness analysis or direct stiffness analysis. The idea that if I take an element and physically yank on it and physically load it, record its response, derive my stiffness matrix that way, that's a direct approach. And that's great for simple elements. When things get complicated, that's when you have to turn to more refined methods. And that's where finite elements comes into play. Now, to properly define what that means to you, it's going to take a little while. Um, the basis behind what we do in finite elements is all based on an energy principle, the idea that the internal energy inside a system is equal to the external uh, work done on the system. Now, last time we, uh, we spent a little bit of uh, discussion looking at the difference between what is real work and what is virtual work. And I think my main reasoning or focus for doing that is so that um, in the end, when, you, um, uh, when we actually see the full-blown finite element derivation from start to finish, when I just sort of make a, a, a one-half disappear, I want you to understand why, uh, how I'm doing that and, and how, how I'm able to, to make that happen. All right, so um, I'll go ahead and skip this. This is where we left off last time, and I'll go ahead and start to pass these notes out. Um, two, three, four. Okay, um, I, I, uh, I, we really didn't get uh, much time to talk about this last time, and, and I'm, I'm actually glad because this is a topic that I think needs a little bit of discussion. If, um, to, to throw a little bit of anatomy into this, if energy principles form the backbone and the basis behind what it is we do in finite element, Shape functions are at the heart of it all. They, they are how we are able to do what we do in finite elements. And that's not very apparent when you're running a program like ANSYS or FEMAP and you're creating some gear and meshing it and, and, and loading it. But really, none of that stuff is possible if you don't have a fundamental understanding of these shape functions. Now, let's go back to this. 
Okay? And I want to make sure, again, that you're understanding the, the big picture, okay? Because defining what finite element analysis is takes a little while, and because of that, it's very possible to lose sight of the big picture. So I always want to make sure that we're tying it all together, okay? So let's recall the fundamental matrix analysis process, okay? We take a structure, we divide that structure into a series of discrete regions that we call elements. We define a stiffness matrix for each of those elements, and then we combine them through a process that we have termed assembly. You don't add them, you assemble them into a system matrix for the whole system. You apply boundary conditions to reduce that system to something that's solvable. You solve for your unknown displacements, and then back substitute to solve for things like internal member forces, reactions, or if you want to think of it in more of an infinitesimal approach, things like stresses and strains and, and all of that, okay? But you have sort of a, um, a, a general process that you follow. Now, again, the point I want to make is that when we're employing finite element analysis, that process is the same, okay? It's not like we're doing anything majorly different. Um, the, the big thing that we have to understand is the nuances behind how we actually obtain the stiffness matrix, and actually the load vectors as well. This is probably more important when you've got non-nodal force effects. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, why present a different approach? Why not just stick with what we've got? Two reasons. One, when we derive a stiffness matrix, the process is a little more general. You're applying the same process for simple elements than you are for really, really complex elements. And that leads into the second direct reason. We can use finite elements for more complex stuff, but it's the same general process. Okay, everybody good? All right, now, the heart of what we're talking about, though, is this concept of a shape function. What is a shape function? A shape function, or you, you look into finite element textbooks, and some people call them shape functions. Some people call them interpolation functions. You might hear them called basis functions. It's all really the same thing. The idea of a shape function is that we take something really, really complicated and assume what the solution's gonna look like. like to give you a, a really simplified approach, the idea is let's say I've got some nonlinear curves, something like this. I could, if I wanted, take that curve and represent it as a series of straight line segments, right? And it would make sense that the more of those I use, the better approximation I'm gonna get for my curve, right? Okay, <clears throat> for if we were using, let's, let's look at this from a finite element perspective. If we were looking at this curve as if it was a finite element problem, the idea that we would be saying is we are going to assume that this curve is represented by linear elements. So the shape of those elements, or the displaced shape of those elements, if you will, is linear in nature. So our shape functions describe a linear display shape, okay? Now, obviously, more elements that we use, the better answer, the better, you know, more accurate our answer is going to be. But let's start also thinking about this from a finite element perspective as well. You all, by now, should know that if you think of these two curves on the bottom, this one before and this one after, if you think of these curves from a finite element standpoint, the difference between this one and that one is more joints or more nodes, right? More nodes and more elements. More elements means a larger stiffness matrix, right? Now something that really hasn't been that apparent in what we've been doing in class is talking about the, the capacity of, of one of these, a computer. That's the whole point behind what, what we're doing and why we're doing it is because this method is really computer friendly, okay? The problem is, is that, you know, Excel can handle a, a five by five matrix or a six by six matrix, matrix almost instantaneously, okay? How do you think Excel would handle a 300,000 by 300,000 matrix? That might seem a little ridiculous, but go look at a finite element model of a, a the, the block on a V8 engine, and you might have that, many, that big of a matrix. It's very possible, okay? There's a, there's a fine line, though, between accuracy and, and complexity, and we need to, to establish that relationship. 
keep in mind, we're not mathematicians in this room. They're, we're not mathematicians. We're engineers, okay? Now, do we want accurate solutions? Yes. But if we're talking about beam displacements, do we need our beam displacements to be accurate within the 100,000th of a millimeter? No. It's, it, it's engineering. There, there is a point when it's good enough, okay? When you start talking about complex 3D structural analysis and you're employing finite elements, the point that I really want to make to you is you are not calculating the exact answer. Never, okay? Especially when we get to the real complex stuff. We are assuming an answer. And we're going to get very close, but there's a point when you've got to toe that line between accuracy and complexity. That'll be more apparent later on when we look at our things like our analysis project. Okay, now when it, let's get back into this concept of shape function. So a shape function, again, is how we assume what the element looks like once it's displaced. And we can get fancy with it. We can have linear shape functions. We can have quadratic shape functions, cubic, what have her, what have you. Um, what I want to do is I really want to emphasize how this approach works. So I'm going to go back to the be all end all, the most basic element that we derived, that. Okay? I don't think it got simpler than that. I mean, at least at this point. Probably the first time I showed this to you, you know, it took a little while to try to comprehend what was inside the stiffness matrix. But at this point, this should be simple, right? This, this isn't very complicated. Remember it, uh, you know, we're, how we did it before, we took that bar and physically yanked on it. I'm not going to physically yank on it this time. I'm going to use a more refined approach, okay? We're going to use a finite element approach. I'm not going to get the final answer today, but we're going to use a finite element approach to get this answer, okay? Everybody all right with what I'm doing so far? Okay. Now, real quick. So I actually purposefully brought some blank paper. I know in this class you've probably gotten used to um, uh, just having the slides. If anybody wants to follow along, with what I'm about to do, you're more than welcome. I, I will say this, probably, maybe not next time, but like the time after, we're going to do full-blown finite element derivations together, and it's not going to be a slideshow activity. We're actually going to be doing it, and they're going to be like math problems. So if you want, I've got some paper. I don't think it's that necessary today, but I'll just leave it here. You all can grab it if you'd like. Um, but what I want to do is I'm actually going to break away from the slideshow for a little bit. You all have these slides, so I'll sort of go through it again. But I really want to go through this process very, very slowly and very carefully so that you understand what I'm doing. Okay, now before I do that, let's, let's try and take a little bit of time and understand what's going on. Okay? Again, what is a shape function? Uh, a shape function helps us relate what the displaced shape of this element looks like, okay? Now, what I have here on this slide is an element, and let's go back to um, uh, our discussion of how we derived this element. We assumed that we would have a displacement at each joint, right? Now, the displacements actually act horizontally and I've got these displacements drawn vertically, like they're actually going up U1 and going up U2. But that's solely so that you can actually see what it is that I'm talking about. The, the math would stay the same if they were actually going left to right as opposed to up and down. But makes sense that for this element, I have two unknowns, right? A displacement on the left joint or node and a displacement on the right node. Make sense? Okay. So let's just go back to a very fundamental mathematical challenge. If I have two points plotted in space, what is the most basic of mathematical functions that could define a region in between those two points? Straight line, right? If I have point A and point B, and I'd like to know what's in between those points, a good guess would be that in between those two points, I have a straight line. So I am assuming that if I know what the displacement at node 1 and node 2 look like, if I know this and I know this, then I can tell you what the displacement anywhere 
on this element looks like by assuming it looks like a straight line. Make sense? Now, what does the equation of a straight line look like? mx plus b, right? So that's kind of what I have down here. I have a constant plus another constant times x. The reason why I'm writing it like this is because for more complex elements, I might have c2 times x squared, c3 times x cubed, c4 times x, and I might just keep going with it, okay? But for now, th th does this make sense? Everybody okay with this? All right, okay. So I want to go through the shape function exercise for this element t together. All right, so let me, uh, where'd my mouse go? Okay, so let's go shape functions. Ooh, that's a little better than that. All right. Shape functions for a bar. Okay, shape functions for a bar element. Okay, so, excuse me, all right, so let's say that this is my element. Excuse me. So one of the things I'm going to define is a coordinate system. We'll say that this is my x-axis, and we'll say that this is my axis for the function, like essentially my y-axis. I know I can do better than that. But I'm going to call it, in this case, I'm going to call it u of x. It's kind of like in, in math, you have x or f of x. This is going to be u of x representing the displacement. Okay? So what I'm going to say is that at this point right here, I'm going to say that x equals 0. And at this point right here, I'm going to have x equals l. Okay? I can do better than that. There we go. That's a little better. Okay, does that make sense? The idea that, okay, this is x equals 0, and if the element is some length long, then this is at x equals L. Make sense? Okay, now, in terms of displacements, when you run a finite element analysis, what do you get? You get these displacements at the joints, right? And for a bar element, you only get two values. You get a displacement here, and you get a displacement there, right? So I'll say I've got some, you know, let, let's take a look at what the element looks like after it's deformed. I'm going to guess it looks something like this. Something like that. And that's my best shot at a straight line, so don't, don't judge my artistic abilities. So this is what the element looks like once it's displaced, okay? And I'm going to say I've got some coordinate here. We'll call that U1 or some, you know, nodal uh, displacement there U1. And we'll call this displacement U2, okay? Make sense? All right. And I'm going to assume that in between my function U of X is some constant plus some constant times x, because it's y equals mx plus b. Make sense? Okay, now, let's just think about this like a fundamental mathematics problem. I have two unknown constants. In order to solve for those constants, I must have some boundary conditions or some known values that I solve for. Okay, so let's keep this simple. What is the displacement at x equals zero? What is it? U1. The displacement here is U1, right? So let's evaluate that, okay? So I'm going to say boundary conditions. I have one boundary condition that states that the displacement at x equals 0 equals U1. It's a constant value, right? Everybody okay with that? So tell me, if that's, if that's the boundary condition, or one of the boundary conditions, what's the other one? So the displacement, oh, I can do better than that. The displacement at x equals L 
is U2. Is that a fair statement? Okay, so let's evaluate the first one. So I'm looking at this above function and I'm saying that what U of 0, how do I evaluate that function? Well, it's C0 plus C1 times 0, right? So I just plug in x equals 0. And then when it's all said and done, that better equal, what would we say, u1? Is that a fair statement? So evaluate that out, and you should get that c0 is u1. There we go, right? So that's one of our constants defined right off the bat. So now our function now becomes u of x is u1 plus c1x, not c0, because now we know what that is, right? Make sense? Okay. So now let's look at boundary condition 2. u uh, x equals l is what? u1 plus c1 times l, right? And what must all this equal? No, 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 no. What? Right there. Has to equal u2, right? Does that make sense? So I subtract this over. So C1L is u2 minus u1. Divide both sides by L. I'm going to extend the page a little bit. And I get that C1 is U2 minus U1 over L. Not too bad, right? So now I know what those constants are, right? Simple, right? This isn't very complicated, is it? Okay. All right, so therefore, u of x would be c0 plus c1 times x or u1 plus u2 minus u1 over L times x. Does everybody agree with what I've written on this slide? so far. Everybody agree with this? Everybody good? Okay. All right. Now, I'm going to do a little bit of algebra with this, okay? So watch what I'm going to do, okay? So uh, I'm going to say rewriting. Okay. So u of x let me write it again, u1 plus u2 minus u1 over L times x. Everybody agree with that? Do you agree with this? Do you agree with that? See what I did? Okay. Do you agree with this? What I do, I just multiplied it out, right? Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to stick all the terms that have U1 together and all the terms that have U2 together because I want to factor this a little differently than it was factored before. So I'm just going to switch what the u1 and the u2, I'm going to switch the position. So u1 minus u1 over L times x plus u2 over L times x. Everybody okay with that? Okay. All right. So let's take a look at this. All right, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to handle each one of these separately, okay? 
What I want to do with each of those expressions is pull the respective nodal displacements out. Okay? So this whole purpose of rewriting, I'm trying to isolate my U1 and U2. So if I isolate U1, what am I left with? 1 minus x over L times U1 plus, and what about over here? Everybody see that? So this is another way to write the same thing. Everybody with me on this? Okay. So far, so good. Go with me. All right. Okay. Now, all right. I'm going to say this is a more useful term or more useful, whoop, I'm getting ahead of myself, more useful form. And I'll explain why. Okay, let's think about this. All right, let's think about matrix analysis in general. When I get displacements from a matrix analysis, what do they look like? It's a column of numbers, right? Like U1, U2, U3, U4, da, 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 right? Okay, would that be a fair statement? So what I'm going to do is say, Let's look at this. Okay. I'm going to say that this is my nodal displacement vector. Okay. In other words, when I do a finite element analysis, this is what I generate, right? A column of nodal displacements, U1 and U2, at each element. Everybody with me on that? Okay. Now, let's think about matrix multiplication. Okay. So I'm going to sort of draw a line here. And, and this is going to seem kind of odd, but bear with me. Let's think about the function 2x plus 3y. Could I write that in matrix notation as this? Could I do that? Right? Bam times bam plus bam times bam. Is everybody okay with that? So, would you agree that I could write, I could therefore, write a matrix that looks like this. I could write a matrix, uh, I'm going to do it in red, that looks like this. Could I write that matrix? Okay. This matrix, we tend to call those terms N1, and N2 because we call the matrix the N matrix. Do you know what the, we, we also call this? Those are the shape functions for a bar element. 1 minus X over L and then X over L. Everybody with me on this? Okay. One of the interesting things about shape functions for predominantly linear elements, what do I get if I add N1 plus N2? 1. Does everybody see that? And I'm, I'm going to say this. Other than beam elements, which beam elements are kind of their own unique snowflake, that will always happen shape functions will add up to be 1. Okay. 
Everybody with me on this? So I'm, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to take a, I'm going to go back to the, the slideshow and sort of recap what I just did because this is some important stuff. Because, I mean, my, my point is I'm going to give you a more complex element to derive on your own. So if you understand what we're doing so far, you, you're doing all right. Okay, so just to recap, okay, I have two unknowns. This is a two-noted element. I have a displacement U1 and a displacement U2. Because of these two unknowns, I assume that the simplest curve that could define the relationship anywhere between that is a straight line. Because of that, I say, well, let's just say we have a straight line as our displacement. And I use boundary conditions to evaluate what those constants are. Okay? And if you think about it, look what we have. This is the y-intercept, right? which is what the value is at x equals 0. And this is the slope, change in y over change in x, right? Make sense? Everybody good? Any questions? All right. Okay. Now I rewrote re it a little bit because instead of it being a function of x, what I really want it to be is a function in terms of my displacements u1 and u2. Then I say, all right, let's rewrite that, and then we have shape functions. Everybody with me so far? So far so good? Okay. Now I do want to break from the PowerPoint. I know I'm hopping back and forth, and I apologize for that, but I really think it's important to actually go through the, uh, the rigmarole and actually, you know, go through and do all this math because I, I, I think it's valuable. Okay? Everybody good? All right. So, in other words, if I if I'd sort of, you know, now that I've defined all this, another way of defining u of x is n1 u1 plus n2 u2 or n1 n2 u1 u2 right everybody with me on this okay now this might seem like an odd thing to talk about right now but I want to take a moment and talk a little bit about strains now you all have had mechanics how do you calculate the strain in a bar the change in length over the original length Right? So, uh, what I'm going to say is an average strain is defined as the change in length over the original length. But that's average strain. That's really not a mathematical description of strain, right? If I'm talking about, you know, each of these terms, you know, this is displacement, and this is original length. So what I'm getting at is infinitesimally, you know, if I'm talking about a little small element on that bar, would a fair description of strain be this? What is, what is that? Think about it. The derivative of the, of the, I have a function here that represents the displacement. And I'm proposing to you that a definition for the strain is the derivative of that function. What is a derivative? It is a rate of change, right? So if that is the case, aren't I saying here that the strain is the rate of change of displacement, right? That's what, in that strain, in in that same thing, right? Now, because we assumed a very simplified function for this element, we're going to find an interesting value. I can lead into that a little bit. What's another, let's go, let's ignore finite elements for a second. What do you use the derivative to find? Like if you're we're talking about graphing, talk about functions in general, what does the derivative do for you? What does it help you determine? 
What's that? Well, if I have a curve, let's, let's go back to that fundamental problem in, in calculus. If I have a curve, who said it? Right there, slope. The derivative tells you the slope, right? So this is a straight line. This should be pretty straightforward, right? We should get, when we calculate this function, this derivative, we should get the slope, right? Let's see if that happens. Now, I want to introduce a little bit of notation to you. So I propose to you that epsilon sub x, the function for the strain, is the derivative of this up here. Now, let's think about this mathematically. U1 and U2, those are constants, right? Those are numbers, constant values. So I propose to you that we can say we have the derivative of N1 times U1 plus the derivative of N2 times U2. Y'all with me on this? Okay. In matrix form, could you write that like this? Or, getting ahead of myself. Oh, really getting ahead of myself. Is that a fair statement? Okay, we have a special name in finite elements for this matrix as well. We call this the B matrix. Or B times the nodal displacement. So, if you want a name for this B matrix, we call it, you know, I, I tend to call it the gradient matrix or the strain gradient matrix. Now, this might seem like a subtle point, but once you have your N matrix and your B matrix for a given element, you have solved actually the entire problem. And it might seem very subtle, but I will explain why later. Let's actually go through and do this for a bar element. So I propose to you that the B matrix is going to be, what are we going to have? We're going to have the derivative of that first shape function, 1 minus x over L, and then the derivative of the second function, which is x over L. Is everybody alright with that? So, what do we have? We have, um, what is that? Uh, minus 1 over L and 1 over L. Is that a fair statement? Everybody with me on that? So, strain would be minus 1 over L and 1 over L times U1 and U2, right? Now what happens if I multiply that out? What do I get? I get this term times this term and this term times that term, right? Which is, what do we have? Minus U1 over L plus U2 over L, right? So can I collapse that by saying U2 minus U1 over L, right? What did we say that C1 was up here? Isn't that just the slope of the line? And plus, let's also recognize what this means. This bottom, this denominator, that is the original length. U2 minus U1, that is the change in length change in length over original length, see? You'll have a few of those moments, I promise. All right, is everybody with me on this? This isn't bad stuff, is it? Okay, 
So I take my time with this because this is important stuff. Okay, so just to recap, we were here, and I propose to you we have a special name for those. We call those n1, uh, n2, N1, N2, those are shape functions, okay? Now, we define the display shape of an element by its nodal displacements and its shape functions. So shape functions times nodal displacements give our, give our elements displaced shape. We can define the strain of that element by taking the derivative. So if you go through and you plug and chug, you know, what have you, this matrix that's left over here in the bottom, we tend to call that a gradient matrix and we call it a B matrix. Okay? I'm introducing these terms to you, this concept of an N matrix and a B matrix and what have you, because you're going to see them later. And I want you to be very, very familiar with what these terms represent. Everybody okay? All right. So evaluating that out, we get the strain in that element. We find that not only does the math make sense, but the concept makes sense as well. Okay. So to recap. We did a bar element and we really came up with two sets of information. We came up with a, an expression for what the display shape looks like and that's what this N matrix is. And we came up with what gradient functions are. That's what this B matrix is. Very good. Okay. Now, I know you all don't have these slides, but I want to just sort of um, briefly run through what's, what's coming. And, and I might actually, you know, go through this. I know you don't have the slides, but I might just go ahead and go through it just to close this out. But I really want to take some time and put this all together because we've got two separate ideas. This concept that we must maintain a balance of energy between the external work done and the internal energy stored and this concept of a shape function. How, do the, how does it tie together? Let's, we got to talk about that a little bit. Okay. So, Let's sort of take this you know, step by step. The concept of real work versus virtual work. The difference being while we were looking at fictitious loads, we still got real displacements and that one half term kind of got eliminated. That's number one. Number two, shape functions and gradient functions for a bar. Everybody good? Let's tie it together. All right. Now, when we did the direct approach before. We looked at things in terms of loads and displacements. Here's an element, yank on it. Okay? What is its resulting displacement or what force generated that resulting displacement? It's force and displacement. I want a general approach and you all should know and when you took mechanics of materials or mechanics of deformable bodies or strength of materials, whatever you called it, wherever you took it, you didn't think of t things in terms of loads and displacements. That doesn't work if you're looking for a more generalized approach. That's why you develop these concepts of stresses and strains. They work in a more generalized setting because you can apply them across the board. Let's look at things from a stress and strain standpoint. Now, going back to mechanics of deformable bodies, you have six potential stresses and therefore six potential strains that you could get in three dimensions. So my point is, in general, we really don't deal with stress values and strain values. We deal with more with stress vectors and strain vectors. Now, later on, I'm actually going to show you a little bit of stuff behind how you actually do stress analysis in a three-dimensional standpoint. Y'all remember, you probably heard this, this thing called Moore Circle. Y'all remember hearing about Moore Circle when you were an undergrad? Okay, more circle is great if you're dealing with two-dimensional states of stress. If you're dealing with three-dimensional states of stress, you got to do something a little bit different. So we'll develop an eigenvalue uh, approach later where we look at this from a tensor standpoint. For now, though, I just want you to recognize that there's multiple potential stresses in three dimensions. For us, we really don't care about th that right now since all we're looking at is bar elements. Okay, now here's another point worth making. If you have, let's go back to that old Hooke's Law, you know, linear elasticity. If I have a relationship between, if I, if, if I have, well, let me back up and say it like this. If I have stress values, you know, in a three-dimensional standpoint, and I have strain values in a three-dimensional standpoint, I must relate them in some fashion. Now, matrix math tells me that I should get a relationship look something like this right? Six by six matrix. 
I see a little typo I have here. That should be 6-6. Six, six. How did I spot that? I don't know. Now it's bugging me. I feel like I've got to go fix it. <laughs> um, my point is, is that theoretically you could have 36 constitutive terms, okay? We call this a constitutive relationship that defines the relationship between applied stresses and resulting strains, okay? Now, right now, we're talking about a bar element, taking a you know, bar and applying one stress. Because of that, we only have one stress and one resulting strain. And we already know that relationship. We call that Young's modulus, okay? If we're considering linear behavior. Everybody good? Okay. Now, I want to use that tensor approach to go back and look at things from an energy standpoint. When we looked at energy before, we were looking at loads and displacements. Now I want to look at strains and stresses. But if, if, if I'm wanting to try and total up the entire energy in the system, I've got to integrate. Okay? So what I'm saying is in a little differential element, I can calculate the, the strain energy or, or whatever pretty easily, but then I must integrate across the whole element to obtain the entire energy in the whole system. Are we okay? So I propose to you that we now have two different types of energy, a real energy and a virtual energy. What's the difference between the two? The one half. It's gone. Okay? Now it's kind of subtle what I'm doing here. Okay, so I'll take a little bit of time and explain this, okay? Let me go back here. This is something I really didn't mention, but remember how we talked about the difference between real and virtual displacements? We're also going to have a potential real and virtual strain as well, okay? So this little delta symbol that I've thrown in here, this is my way of clarifying the difference between real strain values and virtual strain values. And I want you to kind of understand that concept of that difference between them, okay? So I propose to you that I can have real strains and virtual strains. Now, why, why, why do I have the, the matrix terminology written like this? That I'm taking the transpose of the strains, multiplying them by the stresses. Why am I doing that? Well, I can't necessarily take this and multiply it by that. Why? Why can't I just take epsilon and multiply it times sigma directly? It has nothing to do with mechanics or anything. I got to have the appropriate dimensions, right? I can't take a, a six by one vector and multiply it by a six by one vector, but if I transpose this, I can multiply it. You, you see, where I'm, see where I'm going with this? That's why I've transposed that. Does that make sense? Everybody okay? All right. So does everybody see how I'm developing this? I mean, how do you calculate the energy from a displacement standpoint? It was force times displacement divided by two, or virtual from a virtual standpoint, force times displacement. Now what I'm saying is I'm taking stress times strain, but because that's infinitesimal, I've got to integrate. So I'm integrating over the volume. Everybody good? Okay. So, take a little bit of time with this, but I want you to see some of the substitution I'm about to do here in a second. So, let's look over here on the left, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. So, I have that the displacement is defined as my shape function times my nodal displacements. The same thing would apply if I'm looking at virtual displacements. I've got to have that set of virtual displacements right there, right? Everybody good? Same thing over here. Real strains, virtual strains. Everybody see where I'm getting this? Okay. Now before I do any substitution, I know that this is, um, this, I, I probably should have covered this on day one so that you see what I'm doing. And this is a little subtle, but it's just so that I, I'm, I'm being complete with my explanation. If you have A times B, and then you take the transpose of the whole thing because of matrix dimensions, you have to actually flip these around. So if I have n times this set of virtual displacements and I want to transpose the whole thing, I got to change that order. I just wanted to show that to show you that so you see why I'm doing what I'm doing. Everybody good? Okay. So look at this. Okay, let's take a little bit of time to look at that. So 
virtual strains times stresses. What are virtual strains? They are virtual displacements multiplied by a B matrix, in this case transposed. Is everybody okay with that? So notice how instead of virtual strains, I have that. How do I calculate stresses? Well, stresses are some constitutive relationship times strain. And how do I calculate strain? It's B times D. Is everybody OK with that? So do you see how I went from here to here? Everybody OK with that? OK. So far, so good. Stop me if you've got any questions. This is you know, good stuff, so I really want to make sure. Am I good? All right. That's the internal work done. Now what about the external work done? Now remember, work is defined as a force times a distance. Okay. Now, from a finite element standpoint, we split this up into three different types of categories. And here's sort of, the I think, the, the, the easiest way to define it. So we'll take each of these one by one. So we start off by defining work done by body forces. And an easy way of defining that is like, say, let's look at this table. This table is by its very nature being subjected to a body force because it has its own self weight. So it's a force per unit volume. It's analogous to a three dimensional effect. Okay? That's what body forces are. Surface tractions are analogous to a two-dimensional effect. And the, the only simple explanation I can think of is a geotechnical explanation when we think about pile foundations. Where do pile foundations get their strength? Not from the capacity of the, the tip capacity, but from what? Skin friction, right? Pile, pile foundations get their capacity from friction. It is a force per unit area acting along the length of the element. That's what a surface traction is, okay? And there's a number of different ways that you could get that, but that's the easiest one I can think of. I'm a civil engineer, so that's what I, uh, that's what I, you know, fall back on. Finally, work done by point loads. That's kind of what we've been dealing with before, the, the point loads on the, uh, um, you know, like on a truss, work done by that. Everybody okay? Okay. We'll take this, we're probably going to go through it again, but, but I, I think this is really kind of nifty stuff, okay? So I can do the same type of process. I can define what real work is and what virtual work is for this system. And I'm still doing this similar integration type approach, but the idea is it's, it's a similar approach. I take the, you know, I'm integrating the displacement times the force, displacement times the surface traction, what have you. I don't really need to integrate this because it's a direct load applied and I get a resulting direct displacement uh, resulting from that. Everybody OK? You're going to like where this goes here in a second. So I do the same thing I did before, try and substitute these expressions that I had before using my shape functions, and I get this. Okay. Now, where does it all tie together? I do the same thing that I did before. Okay. I, I let my virtual terms stored inside the system equal the external virtual work done outside. Now, here's where things get nifty. Okay, let's see something. Okay, here's where things get nifty. All right, I just wanted to make sure I, I knew what was what. Okay, so take a look at this expression. I have internal work stored equals external work done, right? Look right here, I have this Delta D transpose here, delta D transpose here, delta D transpose here, delta D transpose there. Does everybody see that? Those represent arbitrary virtual displacements at each node. It keeps popping up, okay? They don't have any real meaning. So because of that, and because they occur everywhere across the board, I'm going to cancel it. So I've canceled it on either side. Does everybody see that? Now, now watch this. This is where things get really cool. I know you're probably like, math, oh my god, how can you think this is cool? You'll like this. You'll like this. All right. Let's take a look at this equation right here. Let's look at it from two different perspectives. One perspective is that the internal energy stored in the system equals the external work done, right? Another way of looking at it 
Look at everything on the right. This is all related to loads being applied to the system, right? A force being applied, a surface traction being applied, point loads being applied. What about here on the left? I want to I want to explore that for a second. Now that term looks like this. The term on the left is the integral over the volume, and I'll just use a simple V, of B transpose times C times B times some displacement integrated, right? Think about that. On the right side of the equation was a bunch of loads, right? And here I have this B transpose CB and displacement. So watch this. Those displacements are constant values, so they can come out, right? And then there was all this stuff over here related to loads. I have a pile of junk times this equals loads. I propose to you that from a finite element standpoint, this integral, we have a name for it. We call it a stiffness matrix. You might go BS, right? I'll prove it to you next time. I'll prove it to you next time. This integral is our stiffness matrix. And the beauty of it is, is that this works for a bar element, a beam element, a two-dimensional element, a three-dimensional element. This is how we derive finite elements using that terminology, okay? Now, if you want a grand scope for, for the rest of this class, this is how real-life finite element programs do their analysis. They use this format to derive a stiffness matrix. The only problem with everything I'm talking up until now is there's one thing that these can't do. They can't integrate. <laughs> They're not, that's not what these are built for. Ones and zeros are what these things are built for. So one question we'll ask down the road is, how do we get a computer to integrate? And we'll talk about some numerical integration schemes that work pretty well. That being said, I really thought that was worthwhile to kind of discuss where we're going from here and how to put this all together. And I will show you that if you use this formulation for a bar element, you will get AE over L, AE over L, AE over L. It will work, I promise. The math works out. You can use the same thing for a beam element, a frame, anything. Okay? That's what the beauty of, uh, uh, of this method is. Everybody good? That's all I've got for you all today. I will see you all next week. You all have a great weekend. Again, you have a homework uh, today due next week. I don't think this will be any more challenging. It'll be, I think it'll be less challenging, really, than the, uh, than the truss because uh, it's all linear. There's no transformation. Next week, take home exam. Everybody good? All right. That's all I got. And I'll have these lecture notes for you next week. I really didn't think we'd get there, but we ended with the shape function stuff a little early, so I decided we'll just go ahead and talk about it. Next Thursday? Next Thursday, yes. Let me stop this.